Welcome back, everyone. Rick and Nick's Excellent Adventure here, and we are ready to give you an exciting vlog update. We have a really, really, really good one this week. Very excited to get to that. But, Rick, how have things been going lately? Hey, man, they've been doing pretty good. Weather's warming up. Sun's out longer. It's, uh, yeah, we're, we're getting there, right? We're, we're getting out of uh, the, the winter funk and into spring, so that feels pretty good. How about How about for you? You know, the weather here has not been nearly as uh, nice as it's been down by you. Uh, you sent us a video not long ago where uh, we saw the kids on the trampoline and they were in shorts and T-shirts and bathing suits. And we were very jealous watching that video up here because uh, we definitely are still in minimally in sweatshirts and sweatpants, if not a little bit heavier. It's been it's been chilly, downright chilly up here. Yeah, it's, and it's hit and miss here in Tennessee as well. It's you don't like the weather uh, way to day, you know. It just switches, uh, you know, day to day. So it's a little chillier out uh, the last couple of days. But yeah, but but a hit and miss, we get like an eighty degree day, and it's pretty nice. So hopefully Ooh, yeah, soon that'll man. be that'll be every day. <laughs> an eighty degree day, you can't go wrong with an eighty degree day. That's just For sure. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of like uh, good days, bad days. And, and all types of things, whether it's good, bad, or not. Uh, I believe the blog today talks about uh, different kinds of knots. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Rick? <laughs> sure thing. Glad to do it, Nick. All right. Let's go ahead and get started with our blog for the day. Uh, have you ever heard of the Gordian knot? Well, legend says that it was an incredibly complex knot designed to connect a rope to an ox cart in ancient Rome. In fact, it was so complex that it was said that whoever could untie the knot would be destined to rule all of Asia. In 333 BC, Alexander the Great was challenged to untie the knot. Can you guess what happened? Well, let's come back to that in a minute. While not an actual knot tied with a rope, the human knot is a classic team building exercise that's been used for many years in classrooms, camps, youth groups, and countless other types of small groups. The setup goes like this you instruct five to 12 people to stand shoulder to shoulder in a tight circle facing towards the middle. Then you have all the group members extend both of their arms into the middle of the circle and clasp hands with two different people who are not standing next to them. I'll say that again because that is important if you're facilitating this activity. They extend their hands, everybody extends their hands into the middle and they clasp hands with two different people's hands who are not standing next to them. The simple but difficult task then is for the group to unravel the knot or knots that are created without letting go of anyone's hands. Upon successful completion, the entire group will unravel themselves back into a circle still clasping hands. Common added challenges can include giving the group a time limit to complete the activity, having two or more groups competing against one another to solve the riddle first, and or blindfolding one or more members of the group, perhaps one of the leaders, to allow an opportunity for a different leader to emerge. There are a few reasons why this activity is such a classic. First, it requires significant emotional and social skills to work together to solve the challenge. Also, the group must communicate effectively, support one another phys physically, and be persistent in the face of disappointment or failure. Those same skills are critically important in navigating difficult life circumstances in academics, sports, families, and just life in general. The activity provides a great metaphor for discussion of overcoming just those kinds of challenges in the real world. While the physical contact can be uncomfortable for some, most kids and adults will be motivated to solve the challenge despite the awkwardness. Common debriefing questions include, how are the challenges you face today similar to those you encounter at home or at work or at school or in your sport? How are they different? What strategies did you try to unravel the knot? What strategies have you tried in school or at home or on the field or in the gym? What strengths allowed you to have success here today? And how could you use similar strengths to help you overcome the challenges elsewhere in life? Though the groups are small and they solve the challenge rather quickly, uh, in the blog you can find a link to a YouTube clip of a facilitator laying out the guidelines and several groups working together to solve the human knot. So feel free to kind of check out the website and follow that link so you can actually see it in action. While the human knot is almost always considered an icebreaker activity, an icebreaker, we've talked about these before on the show, but they're typically considered a brief activity that energizes and primes a group for a more difficult and perhaps more meaningful task. 
having facilitated this particular activity literally hundreds of times, I respectfully disagree. Icebreakers should allow opportunity for 100% positive participation and ultimately lead to group success. In my experience, though, the success rate in the human knot is maybe 70 to 80% without offering hints or lifelines like a free hand release or two, or on a rare occasion, the knot is just technically unsolvable. And the larger the group, the more difficult the task. Not only that, but the conversation based on the activity is the most meaningful aspect of the activity. If the directions and challenges take an average of five to 10 minutes, the conversation based on the activity should be at least twice that long in a therapeutic context. And 15 to 30 minutes is a very long time for an icebreaker in most settings. For a counselor or therapist, one of the most difficult aspects of engaging a group in a meaningful conversation is engaging all the group members. An activity like this absolutely primes a meaningful conversation with everyone included. But I find that too often the, community, the conversation just kind of gets skipped over to move on to something else, whether it's relevant or not. Even when the group fails at solving the task in spite of much effort, consider how that is similar to challenges in life. Sometimes we succeed, other times we don't. Remember the story of the Gordian knot from the beginning? Based on that legend, any unsolvable unsolvable puzzle, riddle, or task is now known as a Gordian knot. It happens in this activity, and if you're anything like me and most others, life provides us with plenty of unwinnable challenges. But that doesn't mean that there isn't value in the struggle or even meaning in a defeat. Student-athletes learn these lessons quite well on the field and in the gym. But far too many kids go through their developmental years without the benefit of these kind of foundational experiences. Whether groups are able to solve them or not, some of the most difficult aspects, the challenges, are getting stuck and dealing with discomfort. If you've ever done this activity, you'll likely recall your arms twisting in ways that they shouldn't, awkwardly climbing over and underneath others, and getting frustrated with the group trying things that aren't working, and perhaps asking you to do things that you are confident will not work. Let me offer those challenges again. Getting stuck and dealing with discomfort. I wonder if you ever feel this way in your professional life. Consider the similarities for a moment. You're part of a team who must work together to overcome significant challenges, deal with considerable discomfort, manage feeling stuck, and try not to step on each other's toes in the process. Does this sound familiar? Perhaps too familiar? Maybe some of you are thinking that your faculty or staff needs to get into small groups and do the human dot and in service or training and then have a good heart to heart discussion. Well, maybe so. Or perhaps that isn't always necessary either. What strategies have helped you manage frustration or get unstuck in the past? Better yet, what strategies have other people in your field used to manage frustration and or get unstuck? My amazing pastor from several years ago, a good friend, Ryan May, shared this little gem in one of his sermons. Being smart is learning from your mistakes. Being wise is learning from someone else's. Look, you're listening, watching, or reading this message voluntarily, so that is precisely what you're doing, seeking to learn with and from others. Keep it up. That's the solution. And then be ready to share what you've learned with others around you. Whatever happened to Alexander the Great anyway, let's get back to that. How did he fare against the Gordian knot? Well, instead of taking hours or days to meticulously untangle the rope, legend says that he rather dramatically pulled out his sword and cut through the knotted rope with one mighty swing. That story reminds me of that classic scene from Indiana Jones, who faces off against a master swordsman and with a smirk, simply pulls out his pistol and shoots his adversary. And if you want to check out the blog, you can find the YouTube link to that scene as well. There are probably some valuable lessons we could draw from Indy's and Alex's blunt, but perhaps ingenious solutions as well. But let's leave that. For another day. Yeah, amazing scene in uh, both of those films. Uh, well, and several different films from the Alexander the Great, so I say with the Gordian. Uh, so much to unpack here. Obviously, one of the most amazing uh, team building, cooperative group learning activities, conflict resolution activities, and one that I really thought um, after COVID hit might be gone forever in terms of <laughs> yeah, yeah, ever, ever taking place again. Um, I think it will once again find its footing uh, as the world is returning to a place where people are willing to. Um, this could be construed, you know, incorrectly, but touch each other, you know, yeah, once again, yeah. um, appropriately, yeah. For, you know, for, appropriately, yeah. 
Um, it, it is an interesting, like how you discussed in the first paragraph, um, that really isn't, I agree, it's not an icebreaker activity, really, because it definitely takes a lot more time, I think, than icebreakers normally should, um, you know, normally take. And because it is oftentimes unsolvable, depending on um, the configuration and how many people are actually participating, um, it, definitely it works better as a, um, you know, a more meaningful in-depth, you know, conflict resolution type yeah. activity. And for, again, for... the the deep, yeah, the debrief in this scenario is is so much more important because once again, you're looking at different leadership types, the way people react, who steps forward, who steps back. Um, you know, so much uh, to be gleaned, learned, um, unpacked from uh, you know this type of activity. Um, just also the the willingness to be that close to people as well and that's a whole again a whole new conundrum uh that comes from uh even before covid um and, and you know pe different people have different comfort levels with their space bubble personal space things like that too so it's always been a very fascinating activity um even more so now uh you know in a world that is post pandemic for sure yeah yeah, and and like you mentioned, the the discussion based upon the activity that's the meat and potatoes for a counselor, therapist, or or even for a teacher who wants to draw significant meaning. It's there, it's ready for you, right, to work with. Because if people are engaged physically, they'll follow you intellectually, right? They'll follow you, kind of imagining and drawing out the metaphors. They just will. They'll enjoy doing that, especially when we're talking about you know preteens and teens. That's something they'll enjoy, kind of kind of following you with those metaphors. I had an opportunity a few years ago to do this activity with a, a family who was having a rough time kind of in their communication with each other and not getting along so well, uh, which was fascinating to, to have them do it, support each other, solve the human knot in, the, in this case, and then talk about how things are different, the same and different kind of in real life and how they were kind of getting along with each other, supporting or not supporting each other at home and in their different endeavors. It was kind of a fascinating conversation. So just so much potential for this activity is certainly one of my favorites. And I just encourage folks to kind of make the most out of it when you do it, because there's so much rich stuff there that can be accessed. Yeah, and the link you provided as well is a great uh, facilitation link for people who've never done it before, mm -hmm. just kind of looking at it. And it can be tricky to, um, especially if you've never done the activity before, to actually watch it the first time through or to do it the first time through. Um, it, it can get kind of confusing because people are like, well, what if, you know, like if I, if I can I do one leg or two legs at the same time, or as they're twisting themselves into the knot, it's like, well, if I jump. <laughs> Um, you know, do I have to jump out to get it, you know, as the person who's trying to untwist the knot? Um, you know, so many pieces and parcels that can make it uh, even more difficult or less difficult, depending on like how you're trying to, uh, you know, is the person sometimes, you know, I've, I've seen it done where they blindfold the person who's trying to help untwist the knot, um, which complicates it or, um, you know, you're not allowed to talk while you're doing it or, you know, they they make you know, the plugging of the ears, like, you know, all the different variations yeah, pieces you can put on it. Yeah, and if also, you're working I just, with, I, also, I was going to say, if you're working with at-risk kids who are already having a difficult time getting along, you you also might want to consider priming by setting the expectations for how how they can interact in ways that'll be productive and useful and what things might get in the way. And then of course, that's something else you can kind of talk about the, in the debrief is, did we do what we said we were going to do? Did we not? In what cases did we do well? In what cases could we improve? Do we want to try it again? Again, just uh, so many different ways you can use this activity for sure. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry for interrupting. No. Yeah. A, a great point. I would say in particular, you know, when, when you're at the middle school level trying to this activity or upper elementary school level trying to do this activity, the more boundaries that you set, the more, uh, uh, no, I hate the word term rules, but you know, the more, uh, rules, you know, rules, expectations, et cetera, to set up for success. Then I think, you know, you're, you're definitely putting yourself in a better position for it to work better. Mm -hmm. Um, especially because you're trying to convey, you know, different life lessons here. Uh, which can be effective as well. The other piece I really enjoyed was the uh, the, the wisdom from uh, the, the sermon there, where being smart is learning from your mistakes, but being wise is learning from someone else's mistakes. And we've talked numerous times on the podcast about uh, what wisdom actually is. 
uh, and how that's, you know, it's a, you can get hit over the head a million times um, and you think you learned something, but you don't necessarily, uh, you know, it takes a long time to, to pick up wisdom in life. And this is one of those activities where you could do it a hundred times and still make the same mistake a uh, hundred times. until you kind of figure out, hmm, you know what, it might just make more sense with this particular group because every yeah. group's different to kind of sit back and, and do it differently. Yeah, and I, and I think I, I love that that piece too. And, and I mentioned it. Well, I sent the blog to Ryan. And he took a look at it. and He was like, "Yeah, I use that line all the time with my kids now." Uh, is it, yeah, it's a great. It's not just a great line, but it's a great kind of way to approach life, right? Is you know, let me pay attention to the people around me. What are they doing? What are they not doing? What have they done that's worked? What have they tried that didn't work? And what what can I learn from that, right? And and that takes a good amount of something we've talked about so much in the past, Nick. It takes a good amount of humility, right? And curiosity mm-hmm. to be able to kind of pay attention and try to learn from other people without kind of going in as, as, as if we know it all, but kind of understand, I don't. I, and the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And And so being able to kind of, yeah, be willing to kind of learn from other people and be looking to do that. I think that's that's an important piece of the takeaway for sure. Yeah, and that's a whole other. <laughs> you know, we how many times have we talked about you know Jim Collins's work and yeah. level five leadership and how big of a piece humility plays into that. And how important that is to eat to ever be considered you know a company successful or or a person successful. Um, just you know, just so much still even today. Uh, all these years later, you know, 25 years on from that original study, uh, still applicable all these years later, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and No, go ahead. No, Nick, the, the other thing that kind of comes to mind for me is, you know, is one of the common lines we, we use with kids. It certainly works in the business world, as you're alluding to. But one of those common things we say to kids often, it I'm reminded kind of, remember, we talked to, you know, a few weeks or maybe months ago about, about maybe being careful with that. I'm proud of you statement that we so often use it's used over and over and over. And, and I was probably not as productive as other kind of ways to interact. Here's another one. Here's another one. Uh, so commonly that what we say to kids is what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. How many times do we hear that? Or do we say that? And it's not like, that's bad. That's not a bad thing to say, but there are better things to say. Better and mm-hmm. some of them that connect to this idea of paying attention to the people around you. So in, instead of saying, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" It's like, "Who do you want to be like when you grow up?" Oh, that's more meaningful, isn't it? Who do you want to be like? What do you want to be like? Right? Ugh, that's not just narrowing to one job. Well, I want to be a carpenter, uh, okay? Or well, I I want to be an HVAC, or I, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a lawyer. You know that that's. Uh, that can change, right? We're going to change our minds. I mean, gosh, I don't know what the, the the statistics are on freshman year and how many people change their majors, right? But what do I want to be like? That's talking about values. That's the talking about the things that are important to me. Some of the kind of life I want to live, the kind of relationships I want to have. Those are those are more kind of existential questions that I think are so fun to have with kids, but so much more so than, oh, lawyer, that's a good idea. He makes a good amount of money, <laughs> right? Limited right. value to that conversation, but but so much more value to that. Who do you want to be like? Who are you paying attention to? Who are you gleaning wisdom from? That 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 to me is a, is a pretty cool conversation to have. Yeah, and a much more important one. And think about it. in school, how many of us remember? Uh, I mean, we're I guess generationally we're getting older now, but uh, how many of us uh, from I guess from our generation, our listeners' generations, remember that type of conversation from? a high school counselor, as opposed to what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. I would venture to say we, we, most of us probably had, unfortunately, the former conversation as opposed to the latter yeah. conversation. Yeah. And it's not bad. Uh, again, I, I know Christy even called me said, about the, the, you know, proud of you thing. She was like, I want to talk about this. I don't, we have had many <laughs> conversations um, about that. And so it's not bad to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's just, there are better there are better conversations to be had than that. There are better ways to have meaningful conversations. If you're asking that question, you, you want to have a meaningful conversation, right? You, you're, you're interested and you want to engage with somebody. Well, then, then ask a little bit better a question. You use your time wisely with kids. So, yeah. In fact, that's even, yeah. a, oh, we say with kids, Nick, but gosh, isn't that even kind of a good conversation for us? 40 somethings yeah. is, 
who do you want to be like when you grow up? I, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> there are people like that, that I'm interested question. that, yeah, as I'm getting older, that, hey, man, I want a life that kind of looks like this, that I want to be remembered in this way. The, the, you know, th that's still something that's relevant for me at, what, 49? Yeah. Yeah, that, it's been interesting. Just the past couple of years, you know, post-pandemic, and again, I think the particular – this particular group of adults in their, their, at some point in their 20s, mostly, I'm finding that are looking for, I don't know, possibly ways out of the education field. Um, and they're asking mm. questions like, you know, what should I be doing? And we're, I'm finding myself having more of those conversations and mm. um, asking more of the questions like what you're saying. You know what I mean? Like it, it's more, it's a bigger question than just what do I want to do? It's more of a question of, well, who do I want to be? Um, and that's a bigger question than just, you know, how much money am I going to make and things like that. However, you have to answer those questions too, because sure. some of these people have families and have kids and they also answer those questions. It's not just, <laughs> you know, it, you've got to consider all the aspects as well. It's yeah, not. for sure. And so you're finding yourself as a, as a, as a principal kind of having conversation with your maybe young professionals that are similar to this. Is that what I was getting? Okay. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, so interesting. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. And kind of scary because I'm like, man, I, half the time, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm trying to guide people on these, you know, questions as well, which dovetails into my favorite final point in this entire, your, uh, your blog post, which is, I gotta say, man, sometimes um, I love when we talk about, uh, you know, consensus and, you know, democratic decisions and things like that. But sometimes the Alexander the Great solution of taking the sword and just cutting the knot, sometimes mm. that is the solution. Uh, yeah. you know, the attack of the clones, Anakin Skywalker conversation, when he's like, sometimes maybe we just need like a strong emperor to kind of run oh, the galaxy the right oh, way. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, I, mm. you know, as, I'm, as I get older, sometimes I find that there's some truth to that, you know, and that's not like a, that's not a political endorsing one party or the other party or saying Donald Trump is a, you know, that is right. Or, you know, Joe Biden's wrong or no, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. strictly saying that sometimes consensus building isn't necessarily, sometimes you need strong leadership to make a decision and just do the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever that right thing may be. So, um, you know, every once in a while, you, Indy does have to pull out the gun and shoot the fancy swordsman. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, can gosh. escape and survive. Yeah, what a great point, Nick. Oh gosh, I can't even build on that. That that's beautifully said. Yeah, sometimes we need we need strong leaders to make important decisions that are aren't perfect, <laughs> but but a decision has got to be made so we can all start heading in a, in a direction together. Yeah, great movies too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <sighs> all right, well, Rick, excellent blog as usual, and. Uh... We've got some great episodes coming up uh, following this one as well with some awesome educational leadership tips coming your way as long, along with some awesome Every Rose and its Thorn uh, knowledge and wisdom as well. So uh, keep tuning in to Rick and Nick's Excellent Adventure because there's going to be some awesome, awesome stuff coming your way.